Welcome to the Economic Rockstar Podcast with your host, Frank Conway. Connecting brilliant minds in economics and finance. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Economic Rockstar Podcast. In this episode, I'm joined with Professor Marie Mora of the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Marie has previously served as Professor of Economics at the University of Texas, Pan American, and was Associate Professor of Economics at New Mexico State University. Professor Mora serves also as Director of the National Science Foundation-funded American Economic Association Mentoring Program, and has served on the board of the American Economic Association's Committee on the Status of Minority Groups in the Economics Profession. She also served two terms as a member of the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics Data Users Advisory Committee, two terms as president of the American Society of Hispanic Economists, and was a member of the Dallas Fed's Texas Border Colonial Study Steering Committee and the Early Education Subcommittee of the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Economic Development Committee. Her recognitions include the Outstanding Support of Hispanic Issues in Higher Education Award from the American Association of Hispanics in Higher Education and the Cesar Estrada Chavez Award from the American Association for Access, Equity and Diversity. Marie has recently been appointed to the Board of Directors of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas's San Antonio branch in 2018. She has authored a number of books including Population, Migration and Socioeconomic Outcomes of Island and Mainland Puerto Ricans, as well as Hispanic Entrepreneurs in the 2000s. So this episode is a conversation of Marie's work in relation to minorities resident in the US, particularly the Hispanic population, and within that the Puerto Ricans, Cubans and Mexicans. We explore some of her papers that she has written, as well as discussing some of the research and findings found in her books. Marie has compared the socio-economic outcomes of Hispanic migrants to New York, Florida and Texas and find out which group fares better and what type of skills each group brings with them and whether those skills determine their desired location. We also discuss the issue of representation of minorities in the profession, as well as the underrepresentation of women in the economics profession and elsewhere. We question whether there are racial issues involved, given the lower returns to labour experienced by Puerto Ricans of similar educational and skill levels to those outside this group. Also, did you know that Puerto Rico is a territory of the United States and that its citizens are citizens of the US too? and should enjoy the same rights as anybody else and are protected by the Bill of Rights. Professor Mora has identified equity and diversity issues amongst the Hispanic population. We also discussed the impact of Hurricane Maria from September 2017 and the ongoing devastation that it has caused, especially given the economic recession that has been occurring prior to this. So why not check out the show notes page at economicrockstar.com forward slash Marie Mora to find out all the links, books and resources mentioned in this episode. And if this is your first time finding the podcast or if you haven't checked out the website just yet, why not check out economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts for a full list of all the episodes that previously featured. And within that, you might find something of interest to you, something that's quite similar to the conversation that we're having today in this episode. And there might be something there that would interest you, such as episode 107 with Jacqueline Lindo, where we discuss about Hawaii and the changes that have taken place over time, as well as using Hawaii as a method for teaching economics. If this or any other previous podcast episode is something that you know someone who would enjoy it why not let them notice and share the episode with a tweet or maybe even a text message a private text message so that they can access it and listen to it in their own time and by the way you can download these episodes if you want to listen to them sometime in the near future and just keep a catalog of them on your phone or on your computer and again if you want to support the show financially for as little as one dollar a month check out patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar.com to learn more so enjoy this episode with professor marie mora and thanks for listening puerto ricans are american citizens they're american citizens by birthright we were pleased our book publication date was in 2017 we, we wanted it to be 2017 because that 2017 marked the 100 year anniversary of puerto ricans having the u.s citizenship by birthright and here you have a population that is, even on the island, the poverty rates on the island are quite high, about 45%. And again, we're talking about American citizens. Before the hurricane struck, people were already talking about the island facing a humanitarian crisis. Um, and that was because of this more than a decades long economic crisis uh, that had been taking place. Hello, Professor Mora. Uh, hi. 
Mike. Thanks very much for taking time out, and I'm absolutely thrilled to have you on. Thank you very much. I was very excited to get your invitation. So uh, thanks. Thank you for having me on. Oh, you're very welcome, Marie. I'm very excited to find out a lot of your research and the work that you're doing at the moment because you're highlighting the inequalities that could exist amongst minorities in the United States and perhaps globally, but more so with maybe Hispanics and Puerto Ricans is the research that you're looking for or looking at. I was excited to see a tweet that was posted on your recent appointment with the AEA. And perhaps if you want to maybe discuss that recent appointment and what does it involve in terms of the students, who, the doctorate students or the postgrad students who are undertaking research. Yes, I'd be happy to do that. Um, and again, actually, I was excited to get your the, the interview came about because of Twitter. Uh, and yes. so I was excited to get your tweet. I only joined Twitter last year and I found it to be extremely valuable in terms of reaching out and you know connecting with people on uh, not just in the United States, but obviously around the world, including you. So that's very <laughs> exciting. Um, I've, I am currently the director of the American Economic Association's mentoring program, which is one of the main programs that's overseen by the a, it's, it's a long title, the American Economic Association's Committee on the Status of Minority Groups in the Economics Profession. So it's quite a mouthful. Um, I've actually been doing it a couple of, I think this is maybe my fourth year. Okay. Um, but the tweet you saw announced is that we organize an annual conference every year for the students in our program. So the program itself is designed for PhD students from traditionally underrepresented minority groups in the economics profession. Um, and primarily we have in our program uh, African Americans and blacks and Hispanics and Latinos uh, who are in PhD programs or newly minted PhDs in economics. Um, one of our main activities is that we host an annual conference um, that we put together at the site of another one of SEMDRIP's programs, which is the AA's summer minority program, uh, which is designed for undergraduate students who are thinking about a PhD in economics. Um, and that is a wonderful uh, way to bring together uh, students and faculty from underrepresented groups. So the students have an opportunity to present their research. Uh, we bring together undergraduates, PhD students, new PhDs, senior level economists from around the country. Um, and it's very exciting. Uh, so uh, what I posted the other day was that uh, the plans are very well underway. Um, our next conference is at the end of July. And I have funding for the National Science Foundation and was recently uh, re uh, received a three-year grant uh, to do this, which is half a million dollars. So wow. I'm obviously... Very excited about that. And so that was part of the tweet was uh, and that you saw the announcement. So that it was is the newness of it in terms of this uh, this new grant that I received from NSF. Um, but it's a, a wonderful way to bring together, um, again, students and faculty from traditionally underrepresented groups. And the, the grant that you received, is this to do with facilitating the conference or is it also filters into supporting students and mentors? Okay, actually, it's for both. The main expense that we have with the program is certainly bringing together uh, everybody for this conference. So we we cover the travel expenses of all of the students in our program who want to participate, as well as the mentors. And then if we have additional funds, uh, we bring together also um, other other potential mentors and other professional level economists that we think are really important to have the students network with. In addition, uh, we have uh, funds to support the students, uh, particularly in travel, if they're presenting their research um, at other venues. Uh, for example, we brought a good number of students to the American Economic Association's annual conference, uh, the ASSA meetings uh, that was uh, hosted in January in the balmy city of Philadelphia uh, in the in January. Um, but we that's the funds are also there to help support uh, the students so that they get to present their research and then they also network. So networking is an extremely important part of, of the program. Um, we do have some limited funds to help support some of the mentors as well. Um, for example, uh, if they don't have enough uh, funds in their own travel budgets to go to some of the conferences where their mentees are going to be, uh, we try to facilitate some of that as well. And um, would this conference be held in the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley or is it located in different places each year? Yes. So the annual conference we host for the students, um, this is it's always hosted at the site of the summer program that is the one for the undergraduate students. And the next couple of years, it's at Michigan State University. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we have this conference at the site where the undergraduate students are, because that way the undergraduate students also get to an opportunity to present their research and be exposed to, you know, again, 
uh, role models like the, uh, the mentors and other professional level economists and PhD students. And so um, the hope there is that there's also some mentoring, uh, peer to peer mentoring, as well as, you know, the undergraduates have uh, contacts in some of the PhD programs around the country. And I'm just wondering how would someone apply or would they, would people who would normally be attending this conference be aware of the conference that's happening through their own universities or colleges? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, traditionally, we've done this through the word of through word of mouth, um, but a couple of years ago, when I took over the, the this particular program, I reached out to something like I don't know how many econ departments, hundreds of economics yeah. departments from across the country, uh, to let them know about the program, and it, I advised them if they had any underrepresented minority groups uh, that were either new students or uh, continuing students to please contact me and let me know. And we actually got very good response because some people were unaware the program existed. In addition, some of the programs kept my email on file. So we didn't, uh, they may not have had students that particular year, but they remembered me the next year. And so they recommended students to apply. And so it's really through, if they contact me, I send them, it's a very short application uh, for the students to fill out. I suppose the research that you're doing will be on socioeconomic backgrounds as well. And you correlate that with minorities. Because the data is there that does suggest that minorities who are underrepresented in education may also have an experience of poverty or below average incomes, household incomes. And this is the conference that allows them to offer support in terms of transport and facilitating a means of networking with other individuals who do similar research or it doesn't have to be on research on minorities. It's just that they themselves could be underrepresented or in that particular category in the United States. And that collaboration and network and the mentoring program that you're putting on is something that would allow them to transition into a PhD program or a completed PhD program and even move on into a career or take on a career that suits that type of intelligence or that level of education and perhaps have more representation as a lecturer in the future whereby they can deliver these particular courses and no longer hope like at the moment there's discussion of gender inequality or gender based differences in terms of representation at this level but also a subset and i don't like to use the word subset but within that you have minorities that are underrepresented even more at a career level in education. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that we want to do with this program is because the numbers are so small uh, that we want to make sure that the students understand that there are support networks out there for them. Many times when we talk about such small numbers, it might be that we have a student who is the only, let's say, African-American in a PhD program. And my, there have been cases where students might feel isolated or they don't have anybody to talk with who might understand what their background is. Um, and so we, one of the things we want to do with the mentors is that the students know that they have somebody they can reach out to and network with. In addition, by bringing people together at conferences, uh, it's really amazing because if you were to go to one of these conferences, you would never say that there is a problem with lack of diversity in the economics profession. Um, but a lot of it is like most of the people are there in that, you know, th- that same room. And so it's a wonderful way for people to realize that they're they're not alone and that we do have a, a strong and growing network uh, and, again, a system of support for them. With respect to your issue about women, uh, you're absolutely right. Women are also uh, terribly underrepresented in the economics profession. Traditionally, the Committee on the Status of Minority Groups and the committee, there's also another committee on the status of women in the economics profession. Um, there has not been as much overlap uh, with the activities of the two. Um, but over the last dec- decade or so, it seems like there's been much more integration of efforts. In fact, it, this actually came out of another Twitter conversation last year through uh, one of our members in the mentoring program raised the question that why don't we have, you know, program, we, we never talk about underrepresented women. Uh, underrepresented minority women in economics. And so this started a conversation with the chair of the the committee on the status of women, uh, myself and a couple of other people in the mentoring program. And so as a result at the AA annual meetings, we put together a a session on best practices for mentoring underrepresented minority women. Uh, And so again, the numbers are so small. It's if you just lose one or two, you're talking about a, a significant difference. 
And so we hope with uh, having more voices uh, and true diversity in the economics profession um, that uh, these individuals will, will serve as role models and inspire future leaders in the econ profession. In addition, one of my big concerns is that a lot of policies are being designed that affect minority communities and communities of color uh, and also impoverished communities that they're being designed without the input from people for who are actually from those communities. So as economists, we believe in perfect information and information is what makes you know market systems work. But without perfect information, then we have policies being designed that are incomplete. And so we want not just diversity in terms of what people look like, what their race, ethnicity, gender are. We really want diversity of thought, diversity of experience, diversity of ideas. Yeah, and I think that's important, especially if it's and I, I don't know if it's a racial issue or is it just solely a cultural issue and maybe the minorities who are represented by these programs or are involved in these programs, they are American. You know, they are have immigrated to America or migrated to America, too. And I'm sure whatever their status is, they're still in the educational system. So having that diversity that you're, you refer to is very important to make policy changes. And I, I've noticed there of late, you were recently appointed to the board of directors of the Dallas Fed's San Antonio branch to look at your your research and to analyze regional uh, economic conditions in Texas. And I'm just wondering how you would bring those two together and what you would do it in your role on the board of directors to facilitate this type of research and also to implement the policies, economic policies, to represent. And that's a, a big thing, is to represent these people and make those policy changes. Not only are you representing them, but you have to perhaps, within that board, justify your research and push it through as well. Yes, um, that's a very good question, and thank you for bringing that up. Um, I was very excited to get announced, or to be appointed to the uh, the board of directors uh, for the Dallas Fed San Antonio branch. Um, one of the things that they want us to do as directors, uh, they call it collect economic intelligence. And so we meet, uh, it's about maybe six to eight times a year, and we basically talk about some of the experiences that we're getting. Uh, so they want anecdotal evidence. They want, again, like what they call economic intelligence, to talk about what's actually happening on the ground. And the boards of directors can potentially serve as a rich source of information for the Federal Reserve System, particularly as decisions get filtered upward. Uh, and so part of uh, my role as a director is I, I submitted a very short report, uh, all of us do, uh, before we actually meet. And so we have some conversations about what, you know, what might be actually happening in our, our local area and the people that we are representing. When I was first asked if I would be interested in being on this board, um, one of the things they mentioned they were interested in my input was specifically because a lot of my research has been on Hispanic economic outcomes. Um, and also I've done a lot of work in terms of uh, raising the issue of uh, trying to diversify the economics profession. And those are two areas that the Fed apparently uh, is valuing and wants to get more input. I had a brief look at your university, uh, your, your yes. university's website, the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. And to be honest, it reads like a retreat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it reads like a, a great destination for a tourist, you know, um, and I'm sure students and staff have fantastic amenities. I know I'm digressing from our conversation for the moment, but it sounds, it reads very well and it reads as if you're in a, a, a lovely location. Right. It's actually a, it's a wonderful place. Um, it's a it's a very different area for the United States. Um, so as you know, the U.S. is very broad, uh, covers a wide geographic area. So we are located down in the very southern tip of Texas. Uh, so we're about an hour and 15 minutes from the, the Gulf of Mexico. So South Padre Island is, is really close. Uh, and our campus is spread over 70 miles. And so our Brownsville campus uh, is actually quite a bit closer to South Padre Island. Uh, they call this part of Texas the Texas tropics. Uh, there are lots of palm trees. It has snowed twice in the last 100 years, so it, we don't have cold winter. We have brutal summers. Uh, we make up for it in the wintertime, but the uh, it's mild enough year-round that you have flowers blooming, and so there are uh, it's a very nice place to be. Um, in terms of the demographics, uh, the students represent about, about 90% of the students are Hispanic, and that represents a general area. So we draw heavily from our local communities uh, for our institution. And so it's one of the highest percentages in the nation. And then we are the second largest 
producer of Hispanics uh, in, in higher education. The largest one is Florida International University in Florida. And that's interesting that you also have a higher representation in Florida too, because one of your books that you wrote, Population Migration and Socioeconomic Outcomes of Island and Mainland Puerto Ricans, I, I'm going to mess this up, La, La, La Crisis Boricua? Um, Boricua. 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 Um, Boricua. I think within that, you made a, an analysis or a comparison between Puerto Ricans represented in New York and those in Florida. And there's an approximate similar population of about 1.1 million in each. And you analyzed the outcomes, the socioeconomic outcomes and identified whether they were similar or quite different. And I'm just yes. wondering, yeah, I, I'd love to find out a bit about that, you know, because, you know, I, I know it's different to t- Texas and Florida to, in regarding the university. And maybe going back to that later on, I'd like to find out how many, if you have the statistics, how many go on to do further education, you know, unless you want to address that one first. Okay. Um, I don't have the, the numbers off the top of my head. We have a lot of anecdotal evidence about the students we send off, um, but I, I don't have the numbers. I would think our university does keep track of our graduates who go on to get uh, their graduate degrees elsewhere. For economics, by the way, we don't have a PhD program in econ. So um, I'm when we have students interested, we try to, through networks, uh, try to place our students uh, in in other programs where we know that they'll feel welcome. To, to probably move on to the University of AUM or ANU, is uh, it? Yeah, Texas A&M yeah. is one of those institutions. And in fact, yeah, for disclosure, that's where I, I received yeah, my PhD. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they've actually been very proactive with hosting annual conferences for faculty across the state of Texas. Okay. Um, and the conference have the conferences have the theme of economic issues affecting Hispanic communities. They pay for all the travel for the faculty but our price of admission is we need to bring a student who's interested in pursuing a graduate degree in economics. And that way the students also get exposed to an, an academic conference where they can see how wide ranging economics is. Mm-hmm. So econ is, is quite varied. We can answer a lot of very interesting questions with it. So I always tell my students that there's something in economics for everybody, yeah. uh, regardless of what your tastes are, because it is such a broad a very broad field. And I only recently discovered that when I say recently with this economics podcast, how broad and diverse it is in terms of yes. what you could uh, do. And the people I spoke to have PhDs in economics, but there's stuff in there. I just didn't even think you could do it on economics. Right. Yeah, so it's a, it's a really neat, a neat discipline or it can be. It's potentially a very exciting discipline uh, given the, given how wide ranging it is. And so again, there's something in it for everybody. Uh, it's just, if we can find that and, and if we, again, going back to networking, uh, if we can find people that have similar interests and uh, even topics like you mentioned that you may not realize that you can analyze uh, with a lot of our economic tools and you know, trying to view things through the lens of an economist. That's true. So um, your book regarding the migration population and socioeconomic conditions of Puerto Ricans, uh, within that, you know, there were two cohorts, I suppose, one in New York and one in Florida uh, of about 1.1 million each. Did you develop an analysis on the the conditions of the Puerto Ricans within those two states and how they uh, evolved over time? Yes. Um, And so thank you for bringing up the book. So our book came out in November, this past November 2017. Um, We got the galley proofs for our book two days after Hurricane Maria struck Puerto Rico. Uh, And so we were, one good thing is that we hadn't finalized the publication, so we were able to put in an addendum. We begged the publisher to please give us more space because normally they only want you to correct typos. Um, we felt that a little bit of history behind the book. Uh, it actually started as a book chapter five years ago. Okay. Uh, it was for our, uh, so my two colleagues, um, Alberto Davila, who's at Southeast Missouri State University, and then Avidan Rodriguez, who was at the University of Albany, SUNY, we started working on a book chapter for someone else's volume, and it was going to be on Puerto Rican experiences in the United States. We just found that the more we were digging into the data, that there was a very interesting story going on that nobody was talking about, and that was we were picking up large waves of migrants coming from Puerto Rico to the U.S. mainland, Uh, and we weren't quite sure what was driving that. We knew that Puerto Rico was undergoing an economic recession. Uh, We didn't realize when we first started how severe that recession was. 
Um, essentially, Puerto Rico's recession, and that's what we're calling, we kept talking about the economic crisis. And that's where the, the title, we have the La Crisis Boricua, yeah. as part of our title in the book, because it seemed like it's more than just a crisis or recession. It was something, basically, it's Puerto Rico's depression. The island has been facing that uh, since 2006. And so we're now well over a decade. And this is before Hurricane Maria struck. Uh, what we thought was extremely interesting is that uh, using uh, some of our data that we realized that migrants going to different parts of the United States were not all the same. And so it's, we seem to be picking up either migration patterns or, again, going back to networks, that migrants moving to Florida were different in terms of their socioeconomic characteristics than those moving to the traditional areas like New York. So New York is very famous for being a, you know, a very old uh, Puerto Rican community on the U.S. mainland. Um, what we thought was interesting is that over the past decade, Florida has actually received a full one third of all the migrants coming from the island of Puerto Rico to the point that you have essentially the same number of, of Puerto Ricans in Florida as you do in New York. As you mentioned, it's one point one million. Um, those going to Florida uh, tend to be uh, higher educated than those going to New York. They have higher uh, labor force participation rates. In our book, we talk a lot about Florida and New York. Uh, we try to, we're the best we can, compare also people who did not migrate, uh, so those who remained in Puerto Rico. Um, and then we look at other states as well. So it turns out Texas was one of the largest receiving areas of Puerto Ricans during this time. And that surprises a lot of people because traditionally there have been very few Puerto Ricans uh, in the state. Uh, it's not that there weren't Puerto Rican communities, it's just that they were relatively small in terms of the presence of Puerto Ricans uh, across the country. Um, at this point, there are there are more Cubans who live in the state of Florida than those of Puerto Rican descent. Uh, but if you take out Miami, so like the non-Miami state of Florida, uh, there are more Puerto Ricans than you have even of Cubans. And so a lot of our book, we talk about the differences and, and how the our main uh, time frame analysis is from 2006 um, up to 2014, 2015, depending on how when we wrote the, the chapters and how recent the data we have. But we were trying to track what was happening uh, in terms of the new migrants and how they were settling in. And another comparison group is also how did Puerto Ricans, like the new migrants in Florida, compared to people uh, who were born uh, on the U.S. mainland. And so it's uh, it was a very interesting uh, book to be working on. And as I said, it started as a chapter and it just kept evolving. And uh, we, we have manuscripts. We probably have enough material for several books. It, it, we, had, we had to you know, pick and choose in terms of uh, what ended up making it into the book. And was there any differences in terms of access to jobs? Or would they, you were mentioned that in Florida they were more highly educated, whereas those destined for New York tend to be more into the was it the skilled labor market? Yeah. So, yeah. So those who are moving more to the traditional area, like again, New York, uh, we talk also about Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. Uh, they tended to have lower levels of education and also lower rates of labor force attachment. Those moving to Florida, uh, again, they had higher higher schooling levels and also more attachment to the labor force. And then uh, comparing those with uh, migrants who moved to Texas, actually. Those moving to Texas are, are highly educated. And part of that we ascribe to uh, different agencies in Texas have been reaching out and been very aggressive about recruiting Puerto Ricans from the island. Because of the, the large and growing Hispanic population in the state of Texas, the public schools in Texas are often looking for bilingual teachers. And Puerto Rico is a, a source of that. So if you're recruiting teachers, you're going to get high levels of, of schooling. Um, in addition, uh, doctors and nurses uh, highly uh, skilled professionals who are bilingual also seem to be uh, tapped into from this, from different agencies within Texas. Maybe it's a difficult or an inappropriate question to ask, or not necessarily inappropriate, but it's very hard to identify or aggregate a whole population to suggest that one is doing better than the other group. And that's the problem with averages, unless you look at an individual case. But would that be the case in Florida or Texas or New York, that Puerto Ricans who are destined for these states actually do, be do better economically and also um, socially and perhaps politically as well? Um, because does, does the higher level of education correlate with these uh, more positive outcomes or are those who are destined for traditional uh, sector jobs in New York, do they actually do better in terms of the labor that they provide and 
the uh, rewards that they get from it in terms of wages and so on? Okay, and that's an excellent question. And you're right, that's always the danger when we look at averages is that uh, you, do so, you do lose a lot of information. Um, we have a large enough sample where we're able to talk about averages uh, in Florida versus New York uh, versus Texas and, again, other, other states. And uh, education drives a big part of the story. And so uh, not surprisingly, people who are higher educated have jobs where that pay more. They're more likely to be employed instead of unemployed. And, and also they're more likely to be in the labor force, too. Um, so I would say on average, uh, Puerto Ricans have been moving to Florida, have done have done better over the time period we analyzed with respect to some of these outcomes. And again, this is on average. Uh, it's, it's not to mention we certainly would expect to have success stories in the traditional receiving states. Uh, but those in Florida have been doing better. And then again, those in Texas have been doing even better with respect to labor market earnings. Although the question you asked about uh, rewards for their education, we thought it was interesting in Texas, despite the fact they earn quite a bit more. When you compare Puerto Ricans living in Texas with non-Puerto Ricans, relative to their skill levels, they're not faring as well. And so they are less likely to be in poverty. They're, they have higher earnings, but it seems like those moving to Texas are not rewarded as much for their skills uh, as other groups in the state. Why would that be? Would it be... Like, do, do the work, and is this more to private sector or would this be the across the board, including the public sector as well? Because if you have a pay scale, I'm sure they have to be paid the same as anyone else. Yeah, we're not exactly sure what is driving that earnings, like why the Puerto Ricans moving to Texas are not being rewarded as much for their skills. Presumably, there are a lot who are employed in the public school system and public schools, as you said, there will be a, a pay scale. Um, if they're disproportionately covered in the public schools. That might explain part of it because school teachers on average uh, tend to earn uh, less than other uh, other college graduates. Um, we don't know also if it's that the jobs might look good compared to the wages they could get on the islands, um, but there's a mismatch between, the, but basically they're being under rewarded for the skill levels that they have. Um, some of it may be due to discrimination. Some of it may be due to not necessarily having the best information about the, the jobs that are available. But we do find uh, that, or we found that to be a very interesting uh, part of the analysis that, again, poverty rates are lower, earnings are higher, but when you start accounting for differences in skill levels, uh, there is a lower reward uh, for the education levels in Texas. And, and then we're seeing other places. And so that, that is the elephant in the room, really, isn't it? The, the possible discrimination that leads yes. to these lower rewards. And it's something that people should, and I'm sure um, people do. I, I'm, I'm more detached from it from where I am here in Ireland, but you would be aware of it. And what confuses me is that, and you mentioned Hurricane Maria back in September, I think it was September 20th, the devastation that caused in Puerto Rico and the extreme disruption to even the most basics, uh, sanitation and uh, access to water. Puerto Rico have the same Bill of Rights as the United States, which means that they're citizens of the United States. It is not a state of the um, U.S., but it has the same, uh, even though I don't think they can uh, vote in the presidential primaries. And because they have the same rights as any other state in the U.S., they should have uh, access to funding, federal funds, to support this type of devastation that's caused. Because if it happened in Texas, you would have, a, or even Florida, if we say. And Florida, Texas does get hit by hurricanes, isn't this, as much as yes. uh, Florida. Um, so there would be programs that would be put in place to set up and clear up the area and provide a support network in order to uh, clear up and get the economy, local economy, back up and running. Um, so this thing about discrimination, lower rewards for Puerto Ricans living in the United States, the lack of, I, I don't know, I, I have to be careful what I say here, but the lack of funding that's directed to Puerto Rico, mainland Puerto Rico, to repair the damage that's caused by Hurricane Maria, it's not there, even though they have the same rights as any US citizen. What is the problem or why do you think it, there's something lacking there? Is it knowledge or is it that I, I, I don't know. What would it be? I think that is a, a wonderful question and a wonderful uh, lead up to uh, to your question. Um, I've actually found it to be very upsetting uh, 
as an American, you're absolutely right. Uh, Puerto Ricans are American citizens. They're American citizens by birthright. We were pleased our book publication date was in 2017. Uh, we, we wanted it to be 2017 uh, because that 2017 marked the 100 year anniversary of Puerto Ricans having the U.S. citizenship by birthright. And here you have a population that is even on the island, the poverty rates on the island are quite high, about 45 percent. And again, we're talking about American citizens. Before the hurricane struck, people were already talking about the island facing a humanitarian crisis. Um, and that was because of this more than a decades long economic crisis uh, that had been taking place. Um, a lot of the infrastructure had been eroding away. Uh, the electrical infrastructure was already very weakened uh, before Hurricane Maria struck. Why we would have the lack of resources going into an island, we're talking about 3.3 million people who live in Puerto Rico. Um, that is a bigger population than what 21 states have. It's a bigger population than Washington, D.C. has. Um, I think there would be more outrage if we heard of states like Arkansas, Nevada, uh, New Hampshire, that were you know nine months after the hurricane. You still have literally thousands of people who don't have electricity. Part of it, I think it's it might be lack of awareness. Uh, I think there are, uh, in fact, I know there are Americans who don't understand that Puerto Rico is a part of the United States. Like you said, it's technically not a state. It, it is a territory. But these uh, individuals have the U.S. citizenship birthright, I mean, by birthright. One unfortunate, I guess, outcome of being a territory is they do not have representation in Congress. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, they do not vote for the, the president. Uh, they don't. And, and without that representation, I think that's part of the problem is that by moving to the mainland, you have now a population in Florida that is growing from the island. Now they're represented. Yeah. They do have representation in Congress. And so with the 3.3 million people on the island, plus another, it's about five point, I think it's 5.5 million individuals on the mainland who identify as being Puerto Rican. Uh, it's really those 5.5 million uh, who might be able, who, or who have in their hands the ability to make change by putting pressure on representatives in Washington. Unfortunately, the island doesn't have that representation. And I think that has fed into part of the problem uh, with why there's been such a lack of support for rebuilding. I think that, Puerto Rico has just doesn't not seem to get the same amount of, of news coverage uh, that other areas have have received. Um, I I get annoyed if my cell phone goes out for two hours or if my electricity is out for a couple of hours. I can't imagine literally like nine months without having basic electricity. One of my colleagues pointed out that even though people have generators and so they can keep the power running, those are only designed for emergencies and for you know a day maybe two days, not for months or in this case nine months. And as much as people talk about, well, the, you know, the hurricane weekend, it was a category four. It was not a category five. It was only two miles shy of a category five when it went across the island. Um, the wind speed was equivalent to an EF3 tornado um, that went through the entire island. Um, I was there at the end of May and a lot of rebuilding had taken place. So I was, I was very happy to see that. Uh, but you could still see a pair, uh, places that there was a lot of damage. And if you can just imagine a tornado going through an area that is small in small in size like Puerto Rico, uh, but with literally millions of American citizens, it's it's really uh, I can I go back. It's, it's very upsetting uh, to see the lack of attention and the lack of resources that have have gone into the island. It is uh, because even uh, uh, like you'd like to do something about it. You just watch it on TV and then it becomes old news. The media doesn't cover it anymore. They move on to something else. And I also think that by watching it on and uh, just watching it on TV is or on a news program, it almost desensitizes the yes. the situation because we can easily flick over or the next news announcement comes out, and I, we can apply that to any situation like the situation in Hawaii. Right. I, I know there's it, there's no d devastation. That's a natural. It's, it is a natural disaster as well. Um, they may have better coping mechanisms there, but then you have someone else could argue, well, look at the devastation in Syria and other places like that. But again, it doesn't neutralize the problem and it shouldn't desensitize a problem that is going on in one particular area. So being aware of it and keeping it in the public eye is a very important thing to do and educate because not many people, and I didn't re realize it either, not many people would know that Puerto Ricans have the same rights 
as birth rights as any other U.S. citizen. Some of the things you, you address in your research, actually, I think one of them is new entrepreneurs in the United States, gender and business outcomes of black and Hispanics. And the Hispanics is an umbrella term that also includes Puerto Ricans. Would that be correct? As well as Mexicans. It is correct. Um, and that's actually some of my other research is in the United States. We talk about Hispanics, but as if it's a homogeneous population, but actually the population is, is quite varied. Uh, and so uh, Mexican Americans are part, when we talk about Hispanics, we have the largest groups are Mexican Americans who represent about almost two thirds of all Hispanics uh, in in the U.S., the second largest group is Puerto Ricans, uh, then Cubans, uh, Salvadorans, uh, also Dominican people from the Dominican uh, of Dominican Republic descent, and a whole bunch of other uh, other groups uh, make up the Hispanic population. So when we think about Hispanics, again, Puerto Ricans uh, do fall underneath that umbrella. Um, and depending on where you are in the country, uh, Puerto Ricans in some places are the largest Hispanic population. So in the Southwest, like Texas. Um, nine out of 10 Hispanics in the state are of Mexican, uh, Mexican American origin. But other states, again, like uh, New York, uh, Puerto Ricans are the largest Hispanic group. And I, I think some of that gets lost as well in terms of you just get the stamp like, well, here's the Hispanic population. This is what's happening with them. Uh, but it is very important to uh, raise awareness that within that Hispanic population, there's considerable heter- heterogeneity. Um, and it varies according to the subethnic groups as well as as we talk about in our, our, our book on Puerto Ricans, you know, where Puerto Ricans are living and what you know, their community and what their backgrounds are. And so this paper that you looked at regarding the, the new entrepreneurs, you also wrote a book on it as well, actually, Hispanic, Hispanic Entrepreneurs in the uh, 2000s. For, I suppose, firstly, why did you write a book like that? Obviously, you've, you identified something that needed to be highlighted regarding uh, entrepreneurs amongst the Hispanic population. Was it that they are, are, again, underrepresented? in terms of their inability to access funds or uh, supports or loans from banks, uh, microfinancing, or is it that their businesses might fail? Were these some of the questions that you asked and addressed in this book and this paper? Uh, Yes. So actually the history with that book on Hispanic entrepreneurs, uh, it's a little bit like the Puerto Rican, our book on Puerto Ricans. um, And that is, we started working on a paper um, and this, my book on Hispanic entrepreneurs is with Alberto Davila, who is again, one of my co-authors on our book on Puerto Ricans. We started identifying in the data that the number of Hispanic business owners was growing uh, in the first decade of the 2000s. And while that's not a surprise because the population, Hispanic population itself was growing, so you would expect to have you know, more Hispanics, you're going to get more Hispanic business owners. But we found that within the Hispanic population, there was an increased tendency uh, to be self-employed. So self-employment rates were also rising. So the growth in Hispanic business owners was caused both by population growth, but also something was happening within the population itself that seemed to be more entrepreneurial. Um, and so we began digging into the data to see you know, what what might be explaining that. Is it differences in education? Is it where people are settling? And we were at a conference, uh, the Western Economic Association meetings, and we were presenting some of our results. And the acquiring editor for Stanford University Press invited us to submit a book chapter. So she met with us and said, this seems to be an interesting topic. And, you know, Stanford, Stanford University Press has a lot of books on entrepreneurs. And so she thought it would be worthwhile for us to submit a book proposal, which we did and went through a, a peer review process and we were happy was eventually accepted. And so what we find is that the jobs, there was a, a, a big growth in, again, Hispanic entrepreneurs uh, during the first decade of the 2000s. A lot of that was driven by immigrants. Um, in fact, we have a chapter on gender. A lot of the, the growth was also driven by Hispanic women, uh, Hispanic immigrant women uh, in terms of of, of starting businesses and, and uh, being self-employed. Uh, but we also found that their earnings were relatively low, uh, lower than what we saw for non-Hispanic, uh, non-Hispanic white business owners. The access to capital seems to be a big part of the story, uh, but part of that is related to low education levels. And so if you are less educated and you're starting a business, your chances of being approved for a loan uh, will also be lower or it's likely to be lower. And so those are some of the issues that we've discussed in the book. Uh, so even in our book on Puerto Ricans, uh, we do have uh, we we look a little bit at some of the the business outcomes and 
we found between 2007 and 2012 that actually Puerto Rican, the number of Puerto Rican owned businesses was also growing quickly during that time period. And a lot of that was also driven by women. It's a familiar story that a lot of migrants or immigrants from one country into another may have a hunger and a thirst to be self sufficient. And they bring with them knowledge of whatever they've attained, whether it's in, say, foods or construction, any, any element of that particular sector. And they bring that and they introduce it into their own communities. And that, that grows. And I suppose we can say that about Irish people who've emigrated over the last 150 years. They have brought their knowledge and they set up businesses. And we also saw it maybe 20 years ago with the Polish population. Ireland has a growing Polish population. And they have also set up uh, businesses and they're, they're more likely to be more somewhat entrepreneurial. And likewise, I suppose Mexicans in the US, you know, they're very well known for their, their food and the, what they can bring from their own traditional and cultural backgrounds into a new country and people quickly adapting and ad- uh, adopting these types of tastes and flavors. And we, we see that in a lot of cases whereby people who are moving out from difficult economic situations and going to a, another country that provides opportunities and um, allows them to bring this uh, knowledge and productivity or their ability to produce certain things uh, to another population who op- who t- welcome them with open arms if it's obviously successful and they tend to be well represented in terms of a growing entrepreneurial population amongst their own natives within a new country. Yes, and we one of the the reasons that we attributed some of the higher tendencies to be business owners uh, among Hispanics had to do with the growing Hispanic population. Again, not just the growth in more Hispanics to get more Hispanic business owners, but you also have a larger customer base. Yeah. And as you mentioned, um, if you're starting a business, you might have a better sense of what your your fellow ethnics would prefer, and so that may give you a competitive advantage uh, in the business sector. How important is it for you, Marie? to collaborate with other authors. You mentioned uh, Alberto Dabia, and I notice here that you also have worked with Derek Hamilton, who I invited a number of times onto the podcast, and unfortunately, I keep on missing out. And so hopefully he'll come on soon. You touched on it earlier on that uh, having people within with similar interests allows this type of research or the, the establishment of conferences to take place. Um, so that's a very good question. Um, I've been co-authoring with Alberto Davila for many years, and I should say for disclosure, he's also my husband. Oh, okay. so, <laughs> that makes things so, easier then, <laughs> or maybe yeah, so difficult. <laughs> and so we we end up doing a lot of our, our work uh, collaboratively. So he's another economist. Avidan Rodriguez, who is our third, who is the the third author on our book on Puerto Ricans, he is Puerto Rican himself, and he's a sociologist, not an economist. And we had known him for quite some time, even be- he was at our institution for quite for uh, several years. Uh, but he worked with another colleague. So going back to networks, uh, somebody else we knew, uh, they were working on a book several years ago on Hispanics in the United States. And as a result, we met Avidan through it was through email in terms of they, they invited us to submit a book chapter for their, their volume. So when Avidan came here to UTRGV at that point, it's a long story with our university, it was our university has undergone so several major transformations, but that's probably a different conversation to have. Um, he was the one who reached out to us that he was asked to submit or to work on a book chapter for another colleague's volume. And so that was how we started collaborating with him on, on what ended up becoming our book. I enjoyed our conversations very much, and it it helps to have people to bounce ideas off of and Especially when we're doing something about Puerto Rico, so I'm not. I should say for disclosure, I'm not Puerto Rican. Um, I'm from the state of New Mexico. Um, I'm very passionate about what happens with Puerto Ricans. It was extremely helpful to be talking with Avidan, who is Puerto Rican, so he could give us that insight uh, in terms of, you know, if we were on the right path, or you know, it's like we thought we're picking something up, uh, and is this would this be consistent with his own experiences and his own background and. Um, and he was also able to reach out to other colleagues uh, to share that. Um, with respect to Derek Hamilton, he is a fellow economist, and I've known him at this point. 
I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 years. I can't remember how, how long ago that I met him. And I'm very pleased that we've been able to start collaborating on, on some work as well. In fact, I was going to recommend if you haven't reached out to him to do so, but I'll give it, I'll also ask him to or tell nice. him like <laughs> we had a great conversation and that, you know, he, I think he'll enjoy talking with you as well. One way to describe it is I have these fantastic colleagues uh, in, uh, econo- in economics and sociology and other uh, other areas in higher education. And I love to share my networks. I love to connect people. And I know that not all economists are known for being you know, warm and really passionate about the work that they're doing. It's, it's not always the, the reputation that we get. One of my colleagues here at my campus, who's an engineer, told me recently that he loved economists because he was meeting my my colleagues. And so he was saying, you guys are fun. You're warm. You're just you know, really excited about the work you're doing. And so I said, well, this is, you know, he's he's not getting necessarily the average economist. He's <laughs> getting you know, a subset of, of economists and they happen to be in, in some of my networks. But uh, I, I just think it's really rewarding to be able to work with uh, with these colleagues and just Again, have people to bounce ideas off of, and it it just makes things a lot more rewarding. As well as that, by working with a with a group of people like that who have, share similar interests, it acts as an incentive also to get work done and put it out there in the general population. Because if you have ideas to write a book, you it could come up ac- uh, across some barriers, whether they're uh, psychological or whatever other barriers that prevent you from typing away on a book but having a network like that to get a paper done and put out a study anecdotal evidence of in your case uh, the hispanic population or something in puerto rico regarding the population there and the socioeconomic backgrounds and it, it provides a platform for other people to read and integrate that into their own research and build on it and i think that's a, a wonderful thing having a support network like that and like-minded uh, intellectuals and researchers to really work on a particular area and provide us for the economics discipline as a whole. Yes, and I completely agree with you. Um, I actually found I work very well with deadlines. And so having having co-authors is extremely helpful because it's a way you can keep each other in check. To say, like, if we're going to schedule to have a meeting or even a conference call, um, I need to make sure that I have my uh, my part ready to go by the time we actually do meet. I'm one of the founding members. There's a group called the American Society of Hispanic Economists. Um, and I, it's, we've been around since 2002. And one of the reasons why we came about is that we realized with some of these major conferences that the research about Hispanic populations was lacking. Uh, I, again, I used to have my graduate assistants go through and count at the American Economic Associations. You know, you have hundreds of pages of sessions and how many were actually about Hispanic Americans or uh, were done by Hispanic economists? Very, very few. And so when I became president of the society, um, I made it a point. I really wanted to get the American Economic Association to officially recognize us. Um, and with that official recognition, it's not just saying we exist, but that gives us our own session at the annual conference. We only have one, but it's completely in the control of the American Society of Hispanic Economists. And that means that we can put on the program topics and papers that we think more people should be aware of. And it's a way to encourage others uh, who might be interested in working on these topics to say there is an outlet for your work. Again, going back to how broad economics is, it is very broad and there's something in it for everybody, but there's also an outlet uh, for all the work that we do. And it's a matter of just finding that, that right outlet. And so we've been really trying to raise uh, not just the research itself, but also uh, the outlets and the venues uh, to be able to present some of this, this work. Um, a couple of times I've organized with the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, some conferences about Hispanic economic issues. And some of those have come about, uh, again, just having conversations that we need to have more, of, you know, a, a bigger forum or a, a good, a good venue to uh, to present some of this work. The reason why with the with the Atlanta Fed is that Ash has been actively involved with the Southern Economic Association, and from time to time they meet in Atlanta. And so a couple of times when the people were already going to the comp- the Southern Economic Association conference, we scheduled the day before. Then you get two conferences for the price of one. That you know if you come to the Atlanta Fed and the Atlanta Fed provided the facilities. I suppose that leads on to two questions. I'd love to 
ask you, I have another couple, if that's okay, if you're okay with this, Marie. That's fine. No, this is great. I suppose earlier on in that part of the conversation you were saying about writing and that, if you have any particular writing tips, you mentioned deadlines, you work really well with deadlines, but other than that, do you have anything that you could advise someone who is writing a piece of research student or an academic who might be writing a book or research what advice would you like to share with them that you actually follow okay and that's a very good question too Um, as i said i've discovered over the past several years i do work well with deadlines and i think it's very normal that it's difficult sometimes just to to sit down and do research Uh, you can't just it's not like flicking a switch and so early on in my career i found i was fortunate to have a teaching schedule where I was teaching two days a week. I was teaching on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then that freed up the rest of my week to be able to work on a lot of the research I was doing as, as well as other like service activities. Um, and I found that worked well for me where my Tuesdays and Thursdays would be only about teaching. I didn't worry about research. I just focused on my classes, doing grades, et cetera. And then my other days of the week, I would block off time just to do research uh, so that I, I would just be, I would wake up that morning with the mindset that that was what I was going to do that day. And it's, sometimes it's not as easy because you can't just sit down and say, I'm ready to do research. And you really, I find with me, I need to be relaxed. You have to be in a certain frame of mind. And so going back to co-authors, why that's really helpful is, you know, if you feel like you're hitting a writing block, uh, it helps to talk with people because it, it usually, if you have a really interesting idea, you get excited when you can share it with somebody else. And I find that to be extremely helpful if I'm having you know, one of these days where I can't move forward, it helps just to, ha- to talk with people and say, this is my idea. And what do you think about uh, what do you think about this? And usually you get energized from doing so. Um, presenting at conferences also helps me because that goes back to deadlines. If you have a paper that's due uh, because you needed to send it to your discussant ahead of time, I find a, a force uh, time if, if I need to get the paper done. And usually that's where the these collaborations also come in handy because the your co-authors know that the deadline's coming up too so they'll they'll be more willing and we set aside more time to be able to uh, to work on them it's really difficult for people at least for me and i think i'm not alone if i'm in the middle of my teaching or if i'm uh, doing some administrative work it's hard for me then to shift gears and say okay well i'm going to put that on the back burner and, and just jump into research i really i need to kind of be in the the right frame of mind for it do you have any recommended book that you'd like to share with our listeners? Um, there are, I guess, a lot of, of different books that I would uh, I would recommend. One of the ones, going back to when I was a PhD student, uh, one of the books that I found to be very interesting, there was a book called The Politics of Hispanic Education uh, that was written by two political scientists um, uh, that I found to be extremely helpful in terms of the research I was looking at. It's a book written by political scientists, but it's a good indication of why economists should reach out and talk with other colleagues uh, who are outside of economics. So it's great that we have our colleagues who have similar interests in econ, um, but it's very helpful to think about what our colleagues are doing in in related disciplines. So when you were saying about working with economists and also other people with other disciplines, it does make sense because having uh, Avidan Rodriguez as a sociologist working with you on the Puerto Rico, Rico book, not only because he was Puerto Rican, but also because he was a sociologist, would also give you more insightful and t- allows an economist or anybody from a different discipline to think outside a box and embrace other thinking or other views on how to approach a question, a research question. Yes. And I again, I, I think that's been a big value that I've, I've been able to to have by working with with Avidan and, and other uh, other colleagues, um, sometimes in economics we get in our training. It's almost like we are often trained not not to consider what other disciplines are looking at, and many times we're asking the same questions. And yeah. we we just and sometimes economists want to reinvent the wheel, and it's like no, I think that a lot of you know, for example, sociologists have long explored issues related to self employment and entrepreneurship. Ironically. I think in the econ profession, we've been lagging on that until recently. Um, I think that with respect to asking questions more along the lines of social justice, uh, sort of institutional factors that relate to a longstanding poverty or lack of education, um, lack of access uh, to quality of education. Sometimes economists don't, even if we want to ask the question, we don't necessarily know how to go about uh, tackling that. And I think by help, uh, by having uh, our non-econ colleagues who have a lot of similar interests, 
uh, be part of that conversation. It, it can be extremely rewarding. Can I ask you one more question, Marie? Sure. If you could step into the DeLorean and time travel, what era would you like to go back to and who would you like to speak to? Um, what era I would like to go back to? I'm, I'm not sure about a particular era. Um, I've thought about time travel before, but I always think I, I do like my modern amenities too much. So <laughs> I think like my modern technology, medicine. So I'm, I'm not sure I want to actually live in another time. Um, but there are a lot of interesting people over many years uh, that I would love to talk with. So I, I was thinking in terms of people in economics, uh, I would say Jeremy Bentham would be a fun one to meet. Uh, just anybody who has himself stuffed, I guess, uh, after they pass away. It just he had to have been a very interesting person. I, I, I don't know about that now. What happened? Okay, so he yeah, mummified or something. Apparently, yes. And so, uh, and they used to have a live webcam. I think it's University College London, uh, where they would show his his stuffed body. But so. I always just thought like that would be if anybody was thinking that that way, he would probably be very interesting to talk with. I think that uh, somebody like Paul Douglas, uh, who as of the Cobb Douglas production function, yeah. um, he just kind of like I remember reading once that he had a very long career, not just in economics, but he was also a politician and uh, was a state senator or was a U.S. senator from Illinois uh, for many years. And I just would love to talk with somebody about, you know, you have your econ training. So how did how did the politics get into that? And I would think as an economist, we can use our tools uh, to address a lot of political and also policy oriented issues that, you know, many of the other politicians might not have. So I, th- I think that he would be fun to talk with. Um, Joan Robinson, who is arguably one of the like the first famous woman economist would be, I think, fascinating to talk with. Um, I always think in econ, we don't do enough with monopsony. And so she's the one apparently who has coined the term. And um, as a labor economist, we do think a little bit more about monopsonies than uh, perhaps in other uh, other parts of, of econ. Now there, I mean, the world is full of so many fascinating people. And again, historically, we have so many also non-economists. Uh, but I was thinking more along the lines of on the econ side. Lovely. This is great. I really loved having a, a talk to you and been very uh, insightful as well. And in preparation of this interview, read some of your research that I probably wouldn't have got the opportunity to do so otherwise. And I think this is what this podcast is providing me, that opportunity to read other people's work in preparation for discussion. And I, I loved every minute of it talking to you. And I just love to ask you if you have any or where could people, if they wanted to find out more about you, where could they find you? Um, they can, well, they can find me on Twitter for one thing. Um, I, and they, they can send me an email. Uh, that would be fine. So my university website. So if it would, my email address is just Marie, M-A-R-I-E dot Mora. So M-O-R-A at U-T-R-G-V, which is University of Texas, Ray Grande Valley dot E-D-U. Um, those would be places that so they, they should be able to find me pretty easily online. Lovely. And I'd put all the links, resources, and ways of contacting you on the website, economicrockstar.com forward slash Marie Mora. And I'll also link up the AEA conference that you're actually hosting too. I could put the link up and if anyone's interested who falls within that particular category, it'd be very good for them to um, reach out to you and even attend that conference, whether all the funding is gone, but maybe even next year that they could consider doing something too. Marie, thank you very much for joining me. You are an economic rock star and I loved every minute of it. No, thank you. I really enjoyed talking with you. This was a lot of fun. Economic Rockstar is a free podcast that does not exclude anyone from listening as long as they have a device to listen, download or stream. I have many listeners from all parts of the world and I truly am pleased to know that the Economic Rockstar podcast unites all of you through the common theme of economics. I strive to commit to releasing an episode each week and aim to develop Economic Rockstar into much more than just a podcast. Patreon is a platform that gives you, the listener of the Economic Rockstar podcast, the opportunity to express your appreciation of the show by committing a financial reward for as little as $1 a month. Patreon allows me, the creator of the Economic Rockstar podcast, to be rewarded and paid by you so I can continue with the running costs of the show and to reinvest and expand the podcast into other platforms or mediums in the future. 
To find out more on how you can help the Economic Rockstar podcast and have your name added to the supporters list on my website, please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar or visit the supporters page on the Economic Rockstar website. If you enjoy this podcast, why not leave some feedback or comments on the show notes page on economicrockstar.com where you can also sign up and be a member of the Economic Rockstar community. If you're listening to this episode on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, I would love to have some feedback and for you to leave an honest rating and review, as this will help with the rankings of the show so that more people can find it. If you're listening on the website economicrockstar.com, make sure you check out the back catalogue of all previous episodes and interviews with some amazing professors and authors at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening and I really appreciate your loyal support. I know how much you love audio, so why not get a free audiobook with Economic Rockstar today? I've teamed up with audiobooks.com to bring you this amazing offer. Visit audiobooks.com forward slash rockstar to download your free audiobook now.